Hi, good morning everyone. Dr. Yang is here. Today's topic will be growth and development of the mandible. This is the learning outcome of the lecture. So, by the end of the lecture, you should be able to outline the methods of bone growth. This is very easy. Uh, the methods of bone growth have been repeated many times uh, in the previous lecture. It is endochondral bone formation and intramembranous bone, for bone formation. So, at this time, you should know by now. You should be able to explain the prenatal and postnatal growth of mandible. You also should be able to classify the trajectory of force in maxilla and mandible. And you should be able to identify the changes in bone by Wolf law. So now, what is the mechanism of growth in heart tissue? Uh, this is uh, the one that I told you before. The bone forms by two methods. First one is endochondral bone formation and the second one is intramembranous bone formation. For the intramembranous bone formation, it occurs in area exposed to tension and the formation of bone is directly from mesenchymal tissue where the mesenchymal tissue and the cells will secrete the osteoblast and form the bone. This type of bone formation is seen in areas like cranovolt, maxilla, and mandible except condyla cartilage. For the endochondral bone formation, it occurs in regions exposed to high level of compression, and in craniofacial region, it is seen in areas like synchondrosis at the cranial base, nasal septum cartilage, and condyla cartilage. Now we will look into the prenatal growth of the mandible. The first pharyngeal arch is, is the mandible arch, which contains the Merkel cartilage. So, uh, in the picture, you can see the Merkel cartilage is in red and blue colored. It disappears at about 6 weeks of intrauterine uterine life. You need to remember this, it might come out in your MCQ. And then for the Merkel cartilage, it makes little contribution towards the actual development of the mandible. It provides a template for subsequent development of the mandible. At around 36 to 38 days of intrauterine life, there is ectomesenchymal condensation, which is situated lateral to the Merkel's cartilage. Some mesenchymal cells enlarge and form osteoblasts. These osteoblasts secret osteo and result in ossification. The resulting intramembranous bone lies lateral to Merkel's cartilage. In the six weeks of intrauterine life, single ossification centers for each half of the mandible arises in the bifurcation of the inferior alveolar nerve into mental and incisive foramen. During the seven weeks of intrauterine life, the bone begins to develop lateral to Merkel's cartilage and continues until the posterior aspect is covered with bone. Between the 8th and 12th weeks of intrauterine life, the mandibular growth accelerates and this will result in increase of the mandibular length. Ossification stop at mandibular lingula. The remaining part of the Merkel cartilage forms pheno-mandibular ligament and spinous process of sphenoid. Secondary accessory cartilage appear between 10 to 14 weeks of intrauterine life to form head of condyle and part of coronal process. For the endochondral bone formation is seen in three areas of mandible which is the condyla process, the coronal process, and the mental process. For the condyla process, at fifth, fifth weeks of intrauterine life, an area of mesenchymal condensation is seen above the part of developing mandible. At about 10 weeks, it develops in cone-shaped cartilage. It migrates inferior and fuses with mandibular ramus at about 4 months. And this cone-shaped cartilage is replaced by bone, but is upper and persists, acting as growth cartilage and articular cartilage. Okay, this picture shows the condyla cartilage. Uh, 
in light pink colour, developed initially as a separate area of condensation from that of the body of the mandible and only later is incorporated within it. You can look at the picture E, the separate area of mesenchymal condensation at 8 weeks and B is the fusion of both areas which is the cartilage and the mandibular body at 4 months and then C, there is a situation at birth which is uh, some reduce in scale. For the coronal process, the secondary accessory cartilage appear in region of coronal process at about 10 to 14 weeks of intrauterine life. This cartilage become incorporated into expanding intramembranous bone of ramus and disappear before birth. For the mental region, one or two small cartilage appear and ossify in seven weeks of intrauterine life to become mental ossicles. This ossicle become incorporated into intramembranous bone when symphysis ossify completely. Now we will look into postnatal growth of mandible. It is the growth of the mandible once the baby uh, has been born. For the postnatal growth of all the facial bones, mandible undergoes the largest amount of growth postnatally. Mandible is basically a slender U-shaped bone with an endochondral bone mechanism at each end and intramembranous growth between just as in long bones. So what will happen at birth? The two rami of the mandible are short. And then condyla development is minimum and there is no articular eminence in glenoid fossa. There will be a thin layer of, of fibrocartilage and connective tissue exists at the midline of symphysis to separate the right and left mandibular bodies. From 4 months of age and by the end of first year, the symphysis cartilage is replaced by bone. At first year of life, a positional growth, uh, the one who level plus, is active at alveolar border, at distal and superior surface at the ramus, at the condyle, along the lower border of mandible, and on its lateral surface. So you can see uh, clearly at this uh, picture. Look at the plus symbol, which is the positional growth. At first year of life, these changes occurs. Firstly, the condyle shows considerable activities where the mandibular move and grows downward and forward. A positional growth occur on posterior border of the ramus and on the alveolar process, which will cause increase in height of mandible. Resorption occurs along the anterior border of ramus and it causes some lengthening of the alveolar border and maintaining the anterior-posterior dimension of ramus. Posterior growth of the conda will cause anterior displacement of the mandible. The conda is of special interest because it is a major site of growth. The condylar cartilage is a secondary cartilage which makes an important contribution to the overall length of mandible. So you need to understand that the posterior growth of the condyle will cause the anterior displacement and therefore they will increase the overall, overall length of the mandible. For the coronal process, it follows the V principle where the deposition of the lingual of the coronal process brings about a posterior growth movement in the V pattern. So remember, coronal process have a V pattern of growth. For the ramus, the ramus move progressively posterior by a combination of deposition, the plus symbol, and resorption, the minus symbol. The resorption occurs in the anterior part of ramus 
while bone deposition occurs at the posterior region. Because of resorption at the anterior border of ramus, the additional space is available to accommodate the erupting permanent molars. Now, for the body of mandible, the body grows in three dimensions where the body will lengthen, will widen and will flash. The body lengthens due to resorption and deposition of the mandible. It also widens due to growth of alveolar process and eruption of teeth. And then it is also flashed following the enlarging V principle. For the angle of mandible, on the lingual side of the angle of mandible, resorption occurs on the posterior inferior aspect and deposition occurs on the anterior super, superior aspect. This will result in flaring of the angle of the mandible as age advances. For the alveolar process, it develops in response to the, to the presence of tooth bud. As the teeth develop and increase in height by bone deposition at the margin, it adds to the height and thickness of the body of the mandible and is particularly manifest as a latch extending lingual to, ram to, to the ramus to accommodate the third molar. For the mandibular foramen, it maintains constant position midway between the anterior and posterior border of the ramus. For chin, in infancy, chin is underdeveloped. As age increases, the growth of chin becomes significant. Males are seen to have prominent chin compared to females. The prominence is accentuated by bone resorption in the alveolar region below it, creating a concavity. Now we will move into trajectories of force. What is trajectories of force? There actually a theory suggests that the lines of orientation of the bony trabeculae correspond to the pathway of maximal pressure and tension and that bony trabeculae are thicker in the area of greater stress. Benninghoff studied this natural line of stress in the skull. Hence, these lines are also known as Benninghoff lines. So, the trajectory in the mandible are divided into two, which is the vertical trajectories and the horizontal trajectories. The vertical trajectories can be divided into frontonasal buttress, molar zygomatic buttress, and pterygoid buttress. For the frontonasal buttress, it originates from the incisor, canines, and first premolar, and it runs along the side of the piriform aperture crest of the nasal bone and terminates in the frontal bone. For the molar zygomatic buttress, this has three pathways. The first one is through the zygomatic arch to the base of the skull. Secondly, upward to the frontal bone through the lateral wall of the orbit. And the thirdly is along the lower orbital margin to join the upper part of the frontonasal buttress. For the pterygoid buttress, it transmits stress from second and third molar to the base of skull. For the horizontal trajectories, it involves the heart palate, orbital ridge, zygomatic arches, palatal bone, and lesser wing or spinoid. So now we will look into trajectories in the mandible. A line of stress extends from one condyle to the other passing along the symphysis. A number of vertical trajectories radiate down below the root of the mandibular teeth. The lower border of the mandible and mylohyoid ridge are other prominent buttresses of the mandible. So the photo shows the trajectory of force a is the frontonasal buttress. B if is the mala zygo if the mala zygomatic buttress. C is the pterygoid buttress. 
and D is mandibular trajectories. Finally, we will look into the Wolf Law. Bone respond to even mild degree of pressure and tension by changes in its form. These changes are accomplished by means of resorption of existing bone and deposition of new bone. This may take place on the surface of the bone under the periosteum or in the case of cancellous bone on the surface of the trabeculae or on the walls of the marrow spaces. The architecture of bone is such that it can best resist the force that are put on it. For example, the quality and shape of the bone is formed in just the right the amount that will enable it to best withstand the physical demands put on it with the greatest economy of structure. This is the basis of Wolf Law. And this is the last slide of this lecture. As a recap, by now you should be able to outline the methods of bone growth. You should be able to explain briefly the prenatal and postnatal growth of mandible. You should be able to classify the trajectories of force in maxilla and mandible. And you also, also should be able to identify the changes in bone by Wolf Law. Okay, uh, don't forget to read your textbook if you have time. Uh, I think that's all for now. I hope you can understand this lecture and I hope my lecture will help you to understand better in the topic of growth. So that's all for now. Thank you very much for your attention and have a nice day.